Mary Fields was born in Hickman County, Tennessee, in 1832. She worked in the cotton fields as a slave for the first 30 years of her life. As with most slaves, information on her early life is virtually non-existent. Because of this, we can only assume what her living conditions were like. All we know is that Mary must have outgrown most boys and girls in her town. By the time she was 18, she was a towering figure, standing at 6 feet tall and weighing around 200 pounds. At that time, it was common that their owners never recorded their names and documents. Instead, they used numbers which were written down in books. Slaves were treated like pieces of property, and Mary Fields was probably no exception. In 1865, the American Civil War came to an end, and with it, slavery was outlawed. Finally, Mary was freed after having been a slave for over 30 years of her life. Unsure what to do, she followed the same path as many other former slaves and headed to a new life in the much friendlier North. Eventually, she found work as a laundress and servant on Mississippi River steamboats. After this, she supposedly worked in San Antonio, Florida, in the home of the judge, Edmund Dunn. However, when Dunn's wife, Josephine, died, he asked Mary to take his five children to their aunt in Ohio. After a long journey, they finally reached the Ursuline Convent of the Sacred Heart in Toledo, of which the children's aunt, Mary Amadeus Dunn, was the mother superior. Mary had successfully fulfilled her duty. The five children were now safely under their aunt's care. When the nuns asked Mary how her journey was, she replied that it was fine and then stated that she could really do with a cigar and a drink. With Edmund Dunn in Florida and the children safely under the protection of their aunt, Mary no longer had an employer. Fortunately, the convent immediately hired her as a groundskeeper. Yet, the poor nuns had no idea what they were getting into. The nuns of the convent were very peaceful and well disciplined. Mary was the complete opposite. For the next 15 years, Mary worked at the convent. While there, she received lodgings, meals, clothing, and was paid $50 per year. The previously calm and orderly convent completely changed when Mary arrived. She was loud and expressed herself in any way she saw fit. This raised many eyebrows in the quiet convent. It's true that she did her job well and kept the grounds in immaculate shape, but her behavior intimidated many of the nuns. As one nun recalled, God help anyone who walked on the lawn after Mary had cut it. She swore, complained about her low pay and would fight anyone, man or woman, at any given moment. This behavior would have shocked white women at the time. They expected African Americans to be well behaved and subservient, yet Mary didn't fit into this norm. Also, there are records that many nuns complained about her temper and difficult nature. Although Mary initially struggled to adjust to the calm life of the convent. She did make one important friend, Mother Amadeus Dunn, the convent's highly respected and much adored Mother Superior. Mother Amadeus was a brave soul known for her charisma and fearlessness. She got on very well with Mary and their friendship blossomed. In 1884, she was called to do missionary work by her bishop and was sent to Montana Territory to establish schools for Native American children. A year later, Mother Amadeus fell very ill, possibly due to pneumonia. Despite all of Mary's flaws, she had a strong sense of loyalty and a heart of gold. As soon as she heard the news that her friend was ill, she dropped everything and endured a 1600 mile trip by herself to rush to her side in Cascade, Montana. Mary stayed with Mother Amadeus until she was fully recovered and she was vital in nursing her back to health. Initially, Mary planned on returning to the convent in Ohio 
once her dear friend was better. However, she decided that she liked the West and decided to stay there. Following this, Mary started to work at a Montana convent near Cascade. For several years, she helped to build churches and other buildings surrounding the convent. She was an effective worker and refused men's help while carrying heavy loads of lumber and stone on her back. Once the construction was complete, she continued to work for the convent, but now she had a much more direct relationship with the nuns. Although she faithfully served the nuns in the harsh, isolated community, her attitude and actions made the bishop grow increasingly concerned. Only a few months passed, and already several people had complained to the bishop about her behaviour. Not only did his new employee smoke, drink and swear, but she also dressed like a man. These values, which were not at all in line with the Catholic churches, caused tensions. The final straw came when Mary got into an argument with the convent's disrespectful janitor. Things turned violent and both drew guns on each other. After this, the bishop ordered her to leave the convent and never return. This was the first time after many years that Mary was finally free to think about what she wanted to do. But first, she had to make ends meet. To provide for herself, she did all sorts of odd jobs, such as working on a farm growing crops, looking after animals, doing people's laundry, and even repairing buildings. It was around this time that the Native Americans nicknamed her White Crow. Apparently, this was because she acted like a white woman, but had black skin. As she was the first and one of the only African Americans in the town, local whites didn't know what to think of her. In an essay, a schoolgirl wrote this of Mary. She drinks whiskey and she swears, and she is a Republican, which makes her a low, foul creature. Yet with the pass of time, opinions on her within the town changed. She ended up opening a restaurant and decided to serve food to anyone, regardless if they had the money to pay or not. Unfortunately, her tendency to give free meals to the needy put her out of business. After just 10 months, her restaurant closed down due to bankruptcy. It was around this time that she could frequently be found in saloons, drinking strong liquors and getting into gunfights. In 1895, her old friend, Mother Amadeus, donated a stagecoach to encourage travel in the remote region. This also meant that the US Post Office could use it to open a star route for faster mail delivery. Although Mary was around 63 years old, she was hired by the US Postal Service as a mail courier. Despite the competition, Mary won the sought-after position thanks to her tough reputation and by hitching horses in the harness faster than the other applicants who were all men around half her age. She was the second woman and first African American to work as a star route carrier. It was no easy job. She was in charge of safely delivering and protecting mail from thieves and bandits. She would receive the mail from certain trains, load it into a stagecoach and manoeuvre her way around all sorts of terrain, from rough roads to muddy fields. She quickly established a reputation for reliability. She never missed a day of work and thanks to this, she earned the nickname Stagecoach Mary. She expertly handled her team of several horses and a mule named Moses. When her route was affected by heavy snow, making the horses unable to move properly, she would strap on her snowshoes, throw the mailbags over her shoulders and walk into town. Despite her intimidating height, size, tough demeanour and reputation, some still thought they could get the better of her. Mary carried with her a rifle and revolver so that any troublemakers could be quickly dealt with by a single well-placed bullet. Rumour had it 
that she managed to fend off an angry pack of wolves with her rifle. This may well be true, as we know, she was a very effective shooter. Her temperament was compared to that of a grizzly bear. Stagecoach Mary was not to be crossed under any circumstances. Yet, many fools did so anyway. In one case, a man seriously offended Mary. She responded by pelting him with rocks until he cried. Another instance where she was crossed was when a cowboy challenged her to a duel. She accepted. When the duel began, she was so fast at pulling out her six-shooter that her opponent didn't stand a chance. Mary purposely shot close to his head so that he could feel the wind of the bullet. Frightened, the man immediately conceded and never spoke to her again. Stagecoach Mary became a respected and beloved celebrity in Cascade. Although she was strong and intimidating, the locals admired her generosity and kindness to children. Moreover, the town schools closed each year on her birthday to celebrate her life and special day. Thanks to her fame, local restaurants would give her free meals, and in saloons, everyone would want to talk to her. Unfortunately, Montana passed a law forbidding women from entering saloons. Mary was no longer allowed to drink in one of her favourite places. But the mayor of Cascade granted her an exemption. Besides, nobody was brave enough to try and keep her out. In 1903, at 71 years old, age finally caught up to her. After eight years of doing her duty, Mary Fields retired from the Star Route Mail Carrier Service. For the remainder of her life, she dedicated herself to babysit Cascade children and operated a laundry service from her home. Mary Fields died of liver failure on the 5th of December 1914 at Columbus Hospital in Great Falls at the age of 82. After her death, the whole town mourned. Her passing signalled the end of an era. The West was full of strong and courageous people, but none of them were like Stagecoach Mary. Many legends from the Wild West have had their stories exaggerated, with fiction mixing with fact. But this wasn't necessary for Stagecoach Mary. She was described as one of the freest souls to ever draw breath. Mary Fields was buried outside of Cascade. Her funeral was one of the largest the town had ever seen. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Stagecoach Mary. I really hope you did enjoy it. If you did, please leave me a like and a comment below. If you're new to the channel and you liked it, why not subscribe? If you have any new suggestions, please leave me an email found in the description. Recently I've been getting a lot of suggestions, so it's really hard to pick them out and find them in the comments. So if you really want the suggestion, if you really want me to read your suggestion, please send it to my email, which is in the description. That's all from me. I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Lives. Thanks.